<laughs> well, this is a little bit of a shortening of one that I uh, originally gave at Circle City Con. I've given it at several other conferences, and this was involved all around how the real reason that I believe that the Galactic Empire failed was because of a bad data governance issue. So who am I? I'm Micah K. Brown. I'm an IT security engineer at a large financial services organization. You can find all of my talks on my GitHub, please. Trish is absolutely correct. My slides are incredibly dense because I want you to be able to download, share, and use them if you find them compelling. By the way, Bryson, I gotta say, you got Mad Game on your smoker. I've got the same one. I hope you put it to as good use as I do. Uh, but that being said- I love my Kamado Joe. Yes, I do. I'm uh, the co-host of the Threat Hill Threat Real podcast with my good friend, Matt, as well as I've been volunteering with the Greater Cincinnati ISSA chapter for about 10 years, 11 years now. That being said, if you're ever in Cincinnati, we have a lot of groups that are designed to make your professional and personal life just a little bit easier. We'd love to have you at any and or all of our events. So while I agree in Star Wars Episode Four, Luke Skywalker it is absolutely heroic. I do not think that he is the hero that allowed the Rebel Alliance to go through and to escape the Battle of Yavin. Also, Chewbacca deserves a medal. Where's my proof? It's right here in the opening crawl. Or let me go through and zoom in on it a little bit. It clearly says that the Empire lost authority over the Death Star planes. Now, regardless whether you are subscribed to the Legends canon of Dark Forces or whether you go through and you follow the newer rendition with Jane Erso, that's up to you. But that being said, who is the hero that allowed the Rebel Alliance to survive? I think it's this guy a common everyday IT security practitioner or data analyst that struggles to find a work-life balance. He struggles to get the correct tools, resources, visibility to do their job and protect the global empire. He has daily challenge separating the signal from the jam. He's re responsible for articulating the bleeps, the sweeps, and the creeps. And he has some challenges going through and communicating to Imperial officers at times. Also, Michael Winslow, he deserves a medal as well. So. This got me asking myself, what is data governance? Now, I'm not going to read this slide to you, but what I wanted to show you was that four very reputable sources define data governance just a little bit differently. There's a lot that's the same, but there's a lot that's also different. So what can we say about data governance? Well, obviously it means different things to different people, and that's cool, that's all right. It allows businesses to, to decide what data governance means for itself. It often involves people, processes, and technology, maybe not just in that order. It allows the business to make dis or strategic decisions on how data is stored, processed, transmitted, and access within its environment. It should also help build up the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. In short, data governance is how we decide how to decide. Now, I love NIST. One of the greatest things that they do is their little icons because it goes through and it conveys a really deep message in a very simple methodology. So here we can see that data governance really is that 10,000 foot view. So I was actually creating uh, this talk in Austin, Texas as I was going and camping for an IndyCar race down there. And I started to ask myself, well, what does data governance mean to me as an IT security practitioner as a blue teamer? So I proposited that there are several rules, laws, regulation, contractual agreements that affect the organization that I work for, and that cause certain state actors, in my case, it could be business management, IT security, legal, maybe you have a risk management team, to go through and say, hey, we need to have a data governance program, which focuses on the ownership, the accessibility, the security, the integrity, the and the knowledge of how we use data and where it is stored in our organization. These are then expressed in various policies, procedures, processes, and ultimately, I would hope that we can go through and use some sort of active controls, or as I called it, an actual data governance tools or technologies to enforce policies in our environment. So 
if we aren't required by any rule, law, regulation, contracts, or agreement to have a data governance program, why do we need to go through and invest the time to invest the money, to invest the resources? Well, in my personal view, I find that with a mature data governance program, we can enable better decision-making. We can reduce operational traffic friction. We can go through and we can adopt common sense approaches to our data issues. We can build standard and repeatable processes. And let me tell you, that is absolutely huge to have certain building blocks of your environment that just have security, that have data governance, that have privacy built in from the seed is awesome. It can go through and reduce the cost and increase effectiveness of all of our other controls. And for me, I'm a big, big believer in transparency. We are allies of the business. We are defenders of the business. We need to be sure that we are open, transparent, and that we have earned our peers' trust. So I came up with the tool, Actionable Data Governance Tool. There's probably a better tool out there, but this was what I came up with at the time. So this is a control that allows us to go through and to apply some sort of policy that is in alignment to our data governance program. So this can be like a permit, a permit with a special encryption, like requiring a dig excuse me, digital signature or requiring the file to be encrypted in transit. It could be permit with the justification where we ask the user, hey, we're seeing this odd behavior. Can you help us understand what is going on here? We can permit with an alert, we can deny with an alert, or we could deny it without an alert. You might have other options in your environment. So of course, when we're talking about data governance, there's, of course, the Triforce of store, process, and transmit. But I think there's a fourth, a hidden Triforce, and that's identity and access. And I say that because primarily most of the data governance tools that I use on a day-to-day -day basis go through and make the fundamental assumption, not that it's right, not that it's wrong, it's just what they do, that the user, that the entity, that the process that is making a request of a system is actually that system. And as we can talk with any of our peers that are more on the red or purple team, they've gotten pretty good at asserting and taking over other entities, be they users, be they com computer assets. So in my mind, this identity and access is absolutely a huge fundamental part of any data governance program. Now, in spending four years of my life standing up a global data loss prevention environment, I came up with this saying that I used often, is that there is no false positives, there's only poorly written rules. And it got to be a meme within my organization, but it became very effective. And why I say that is at the beginning of our process, we were just throwing out, oh, that was a false positive. Oh, that alert was a false positive. And what were we saying when we said that's a false positive? We're saying that we got an alert from our system, that we went in, we did our research, we evaluated things. And at the end of the day, we believe that, that alert was in air, that we wasted our time. And so as we saw the system turning out 30, 40, 50% false positives, what were we telling ourselves? What were we communicating to our managers? We were saying, hey, this tool stinks. So instead of that, I challenged my team, let's take a look at our alerts on validity versus accuracy. So validity, did we get the desired result? So what I would do is I'd strip out human emotion, I'd look at the input, I'd look at the rule, and I have to say almost every time I did that, I agreed that we were getting valid alerts out of the system based on both what was coming into the system and the rules. And that was really interesting to me, but the accuracy, did we detect on what we think we should have? That was a bit down. So by changing to viewing things through accuracy versus validity, we were actually able to go through and to start to communicate hey, we need to work on tuning our system. We need to work on our definitions. And I think that was an incredible breakthrough for me actually going through and modernizing 
our concept of what DLP, data loss prevention, data governance tools could be. So I wanted to come up with a framework. So within my volunteering with the Greater Cincinnati ISSA, we do have certain members that are definitely the executive management level, but we have a lot of people that are, you know, at the small to medium business, we have people that are entrepreneurs that are doing the whole IT stack themselves. And we had IT practitioners that now had security formally thrown on their shoulders. So I wanted to have something of simple framework that I could point them to, and I could say, here's how I would bulk things into first, second, and third order events. Easy, medium, and oh my gosh, this is going to be a challenge. So I absolutely love the CIS top 20 controls. And so I built off of that simple framework. The reason why I love the CIS top 20 controls is because off of a single printout, one page, I can hand it to someone, anyone within my organization, and I can have a real detailed talk about what we are doing, why we're doing it, and where we are going in the future. So you can see these, uh, nine different controls that I created for the framework that I've leveraged extensively within my greater Cincinnati area. And this is, I know there's a lot going on here. So what I'm trying to do is compare and contrast and depending on the specific spot product you pick, it might have more or less functionality, but at the top in the green, what I'm trying to express is you as the IT security practitioner, how much authority you have over those systems. Then the gray boxes, those are the actual types of formal assets, whereas the blue bars are those nine data governance controls that I referenced. And then the stop sign indicates that it can block, the uh, triangle arrow is an alert, and the green circle is that it can generally enforce policy. And once again, I know I'm giving you a ton of information here. There's even more in the full version that's on my GitHub, but Let's go through and do a mini deep dive on three of these. So let's start talking about the basic controls. And for the first basic control, I wanted to circle in on file and disk encryption and key management. Of course, whenever we're dealing with encryption, it's only as strong as we're protecting those keys. So we need to make sure that we are protecting them correctly. Working for an international organization, I have to be very careful when I am deploying cryptography, I do not violate any rules, laws, regulations. Please talk to your friendly lawyers. That being said, when you go through and you implement advanced encryption such as FIPS 140, depending on your tool, you might lose some functionality. So make sure to talk to your friendly vendors and to fully understand what any implications of turning on that higher level of cryptography is so that you can go through and go into it with eyes wide open. Now, it's become very popular to go through and to encrypt portable media. And generally there's two ways that you can do it. You can either encrypt the whole piece of portable media, or you can just encrypt the files written from your managed system onto that piece of portable media. I prefer the latter, the file level of encryption, but there's good points or good points why you might choose the full disk encryption. Either way, we need to be very careful. I have a friend who uh, works in a similar industry within Cincinnati, and they were working on rolling out portable media encryption, and they have a lot of, uh, how should I say, drivers that go out and help people with insurance policies. And those drivers were actually leveraging legacy uh, GPS systems. And what was not caught in time is that when people went through and plugged their GPS systems into their corporate laptops in order to go through and update the maps, the actual file disk or the full disk encryption that they were doing was encrypting the entire GPS, bricking them. Luckily, uh, the mistake was caught pretty early, so the damage was less, but we need to make sure that we are open and transparent about what we are doing with our users because you do not want to be the person that accidentally encrypted, you know, a family's thumb drive that was full of personal pictures. That being said, we also need to go through and to be extremely careful not to brick devices that we do not own. 
And finally, in the terms of file and disk encryption, you know, we need to be careful of when we encrypt files on network shares. We need to understand how key management works. You know, this is where I think Apple, Google, and Microsoft, they've done a lot of good in our community over the past 10 years in making encryption that's something approachable for every person on their new devices. But we need to make sure that we are going through and implementing it with honor and that we're doing it in an open and transparent way. So now let's move on to the foundational controls. So for this, I picked data classification. And the reason why I picked this is because an effective data classification strategy is absolutely needed for you to move further along your trail. So when it comes to data classification, there are generally two strategies. And it's not that one works better than the other. I think they work better together, and I think they break in different ways. So traditional data classification is based on a series of data objects, be it text, text dictionaries, regular expression dictionaries, pattern matching, and Boolean logic. Now, this can serve a couple different challenges. So many DLP type engines have different versions of regex, have different functionalities. So that might make it hard, difficult, or you might not be able to carry over a classification one for one between multiple systems. Another problem with it is that these, it's very easy to get around these type of data classifications uh, with a, just the most minor bit of obfuscation. And we'll touch on that in a bit. I'll show you some really cool things. Secondly, we can do meta tag data. So within many popular Office type suites, there is a way that you can empower your users to go through and apply an internal data classification into the header or the meta tag area of every file. Now, this is awesome because it does a couple quick things. First off, these types of scans on files are super lightweight. The second thing is every time we ask a user to go through and to classify an item for us, a couple magical things happen. First, we're telling our users, hey, we as an organization, we value our data. We wanna be good data stewards. And then generally when you implement these, you can either hover over or, you, or there's a little like three sentence description that can help guide the user to go through and to select the correct data classification. Now, this is great. We're training, we're bringing our users in act inviting them to be part of our data stewardship. However, if I'm a bad guy, if I'm a malicious actor, no, I'm just going to lie and I'm going to get through it. So this is where I think that using both together is very powerful. So let's talk about a couple different challenges with data classifications. The first, we, have, we currently have, at the time of this recording, 50 states, and each state is allowed to create their driver's license in any way, shape, or form that they want. So in my driver's license regex, I have 26 positive matches, and I'm gonna show those to you. Secondly, many websites use a 15, 16 digit code to or numeric code to reference contact. What does that look like? It looks like a credit card number. Obviously, regular expressions and word dictionaries are not optimal and we need to do better in a couple of ways where I've really upped my game in writing data classification especially using traditional data classification is to follow the primary rule of improv and always combine sentences with yes and that has led me to go through and to significantly reduce the suboptimal detections likewise we can use proximity rules that's where we're looking for condition a and condition B within so many characters of each other. So on the left, you're going to see my driver's license match. Now, this is great and all, but we were matching on things that we really shouldn't have been matching on. We are matching on our user IDs, our admin IDs, simple year, 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 day, or month, month, day, day, or day, day, month, month, year, 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 day date stamps, we are matching on change tickets, problem tickets, incident tickets, uh, service desk tickets. So we had to go through and reject all of the actual regular expressions that are in that uh, grayed out box on the right. So let's move on to the organizational controls. So data loss prevention. 
to me, data loss prevention is actually a combination of multiple different tools that work together to go through and to apply actual data governance rules in, within your environment. So we've got things like the DLP client. So this sits on your laptop and applies policy to how your users are interacting with your laptop. DLP network is kind of like IDS IPS. It scans a specific network traffic, a network port, and it makes permit deny decisions there. A DLP repository scanner is a system that'll scan your unstructured data. So it could be shares, it could be databases, it could be your NAS, it could be your SAN, and it'll go through and it will report back to where it thinks there's potentially sensitive information within your environment. You've got DLP email, DLP web. So respectively, I like to scan both incoming and outgoing. I like to scan incoming because I want to be very open and transparent with my users. And if I, even though I can't be a good data steward until I receive a piece of information, if I see information coming in a suboptimal way, I'd like to be the one to bring that to the attention of whoever's collecting that data and say, hey, I think I've got a better way for us to do that. And finally, and this is this is probably the most challenging part, in my opinion, the DLP management console. So this is the central piece of software that orchestrates your DLP environment. And if you think about it, DLP is set to catch our most sensitive information. And so what we want to do is when we do get an alert, we generally attach the primary file and we probably attach a, a bit or all of what flagged it. And we also capture the basic who, what, where, when, why. But if I've got my offensive hat on and I take a look at the services that are running, I see, oh, there's a DLP agent, you better believe that I want to go through and get access to that DLP console by hook or by crook because I'm going to see those incidents because if I find a file that has potentially sensitive information in a specific repository, chances are I'm going to find other sensitive information in that environment. So I know we're coming up on time here and I want to be respectful to everyone's time. So if you would like to reach out, I'd love to continue this conversation here, there, anywhere. If you do uh, run any type of IT security group and you see a talk that I would like or that you would like me to present, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to do that. I want to thank everyone at Scythe and Grimm that have helped put this on. You have immensely helped me over the past 18 months. So. Thank you for this edutainment. Thank you and any questions. Zero trust, right? Zero trust architecture is, is now all the rage. And since it was, uh, it has been mandated to the federal government through the Biden executive order. Um, and to me, what makes zero trust so hard is the data. Right, it's easy to mm -hmm. just be like, well, we're going to just have this, but actually having the data to do that. So, what advice would you would you give the federal government who is in the position it has? Right, like system sprawl, software sprawl, data sprawl, largest system in the world. What do they do, Micah? So, right now, that is something that is very pertinent to my professional job, and where I where we're really going through and we're focusing a lot of our efforts and it's harder than you can possibly believe it's what i call intimacy or into me i see you need to understand how your organization works you need to understand your data flows uh, in terms of network segmentation you know that's only a part of it you also have to understand how are you going to go through and quantify all of your identities and what identities do you are you actually running uh, so, you know, we've got users, we probably have uh, admins, we probably have help desk, we probably have service accounts in that uh, non-human accounts that interact with computer to computer communication, getting an inventory of all that and then creating your use cases. And this is where I struggle the most is defining the actual identity plus the type of connection plus the uh, frequency or the normalness of the connection into an actual like low, medium, high and defining what we do at each one of those, uh, how should I say, checkpoints. To sum it up, I'm glad I don't have that job. <laughs> nice love guru reference, by the way, Micah. Hey, good. I'm glad you got that. Of course. Uh, what about, what about multi-cloud? 
So that's something oh. that we're also going through. And for multi-cloud, you, I really focus on where am I putting my policy engines? Am I forcing everything through a centralized IT security cloud or am, and have it all be unified there? Or do I have embed multiple instances of those protection engines within each cloud environment? And once again, this is going to come back to your own risk tolerance, your own policies and procedures, but I'm a big, I'm becoming more and more of a big fan of a unified security hub. A unified security hub. Correct. You mean like a Death Star? Um, <laughs> not quite a Death Star, a protection star. It's, it's one of those things where if you think about one of the talks I gave was on web application firewalls, and so if you could embed within whatever your security cloud is, that all traffic passing from your trusted environment or environments going out to the internet or anything coming from any external coming into your environment has to go through you know, a unified security fabric that has you know, a combination of all of your web application firewalls, your dynamic firewalls, uh, your IPSs, your IDSs, your DLP, uh, your CASB, your SASE, whatever controls that you have implemented, and having that at the cloud edge, especially for cloud resources, that's kind of where my mind is right now. All right. Since we're discussing Star Wars, who shot first? Of course, Han shot first. Han shot first. Come on. Does anybody actually believe otherwise? Like, this is a serious question. Kyle Katarn believes. Well, I mean, just honestly, like, whoever shot first would win that fight at that range. It like, depends on the, the way that setting. could have shot first and missed. It depends on the setting. But we know the setting. We They were there in most Eisley. They're, like, right across from the table. He has the gun pulled on him. If he had shot first, he would have shot hot. I mean, I, I don't think even with Stormtrooper accuracy, he could have missed. I think there's wisdom in that. <laughs> I loved the uh, point about Chewie needing a medal. It's true. <laughs> well, you see, you see, I fixed it there. Love it. Oh, Love it. That. That's so That's funny. A nice little uh, bonus. Hold on. I got to get a picture of that. Yep. That's good. So All thank right. you very much for this opportunity. I've uh, really enjoyed it. And please feel well, free you. to uh, to anyone listening or watching, please feel free. Uh, I'd love to continue this conversation. Are you on the Discord in the expert um, channel? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, make sure that you are tagged as a speaker. If you are not already, you are not. Let's get that. No, yeah, you are. Good. All right, so for those of you who want to ask more questions, because uh, Mike clearly has a lot more he could have presented, uh, and Trisha, you were right. That was a very text-dense slideshow. It it led with the powerful graphics, and then it went right into the hardcore text. You you should yeah. see my web application firewall one. It would make uh, Trisha's uh, brain break. I did see it. I did see it. And um, yeah, it's it was so funny because when we were doing our talk together, um, it was something that we discussed multiple times. And the yeah. you know the final consensus, which I do really agree and, and respect actually a lot about Micah, is that all of his talks really are intended to to teach and learn. And having that GitHub repository in the event that you couldn't see the talk itself, like this, the PowerPoint does stand on its own, which is cool um, for sure. As a marketer, you know, it just kills me inside a little. Not a big deal. Only a little, though. <laughs> Any final thoughts, Micah, for the audience? Uh, you know what? I Anyone that is interested in presenting, I strongly suggest that you go through and pursue it. I have gotten so much back from the community ever since I started putting myself out there I found a lot of confidence, I've created a lot of opportunities. It's opened up some great friendships, so I highly recommend it. 
And we have a new speaker track here to help you do it. Uh, this year we paired with uh, Share the Mic and Cyber as well. So I, I hope that we continue that partnership. Excellent, you guys have been doing absolutely wonderful work. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.